Okay. So um, we are here for a fifth of the series of lectures, which is happening today. And uh, as you can see, this uh, lecture is uh, organized by. Uh, just a moment. I think we need to unmute Dr. Ranjit as well. Dr. Ranjit has to unmute. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Ranjit is unmute. Uh, we are. This is the fifth of the series of lectures which is there, and uh, we are here to welcome Dr. Osgur, who is there from Germany, uh, with us. And uh, as you can see, this event is uh, supported by uh, under the AGs of. Uh, Indo-Pacific Academy of uh, Forensic Odontology, uh, Association of Forensic Odontology for Human Rights. Then we have uh, Indian Association of Craniofacial Identification. And then that is, that is a team of mine which works, which has uh, myself, uh, Dr. Priyanka, Dr. Dipika, we have Dr. Pooja. And uh, we are here gathered here to uh, learn more about 3D facial reconstruction. Um, before introducing uh, our magician lecturer who's there today, who builds up faces from ashes, uh, I would like to tell about him that uh, he is uh, uh, Dr. Osgur Bulut, who has a background of uh, forensic anthropology, craniofacial anthropology, 3D uh, virtual anthropology, forensic science, 3D modeling. He has a master's in, uh, he, he has a MA, MSc, uh, PhD from Ghazi, uh, Dundee and uh, Ankara University, respectively. He works uh, as in the forensic laboratory since 15 years now. He has trained more than 2,000 forensic cases uh, related to craniofacial identification. Osgur offers uh, undergraduate, graduate courses on facial reconstruction, uh, 3D computerized uh, reconstructions. Um, at present, he's working as a lecturer and a postgraduate researcher in the University of Tübingen. He is also an adjoint lecturer in the University of Applied Sciences of the Bondrian. Uh, University. He's a member of uh, uh, ILMS uh, and I, uh, FACE. That happens to be both uh, related to the forensic sciences. He's an editor of various journals, including prestigious FSI, LM, and uh, PLOS One, and archaeological, anthropological sciences. This is in brief, I am telling you. It is very difficult to put him in words, what work he does. It is very difficult to really uh, concise it. For me, what he is, I will play an AV. I will explain what it has been past one month, uh, just after that lockdown, uh, what was there with me and him. I'll just play an AV. So I think you have shared some other screen. So uh, you just stop sharing this screen and select the screen share of uh, that video. Okay. And uh, where is that screen supposed to be? Uh, you just click on again, share screen button. You will get the window, different screen. Is it playing now? No, sir. Yes. Now it's working. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
that's uh, my uh, dedication to Osgur. Uh, now, uh, I would like uh, one, one more, before he, I give the mic to him, uh, before, uh, I would like to add that we had different hairstyles before that. And uh, second thing which I want to add is my, um, uh, one more screen I want to share that, which was, I think was not visible. Uh, that is, uh, just, just before I give him the thing. Can everybody see this sc screen right now? Yes, sir. Okay, this is the screen which I wanted to know. These are the three people and this is the logo. This is actually the brochure of this. And I hand over the mic to Dr. Os Osgur after this. Uh, uh, please go ahead, Dr. Osgur. Okay. Um, you can share screen. You can hear me, right? Excuse me? You can hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you are all very well. Uh, I know that we are in difficult times in these uh, coronavirus pandemic days. Uh, we are fighting for it in these days, and I hope you are all staying healthy. Um, Aman, thank you very much for, for, for the video. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you for your compliments. Um, and also, I would like to thank to you for organizing, thank to you and your, your team uh, for organizing this um, amazing uh, online platform. I'm very, very pleased to meet the guys, um, hundreds of guys, hundreds of colleagues who are interested in um, facial reconstruction. I'm very, very pleased about it. Um, and uh, actually, I don't know what to say about, uh, should I say good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening? Uh, it's, because it's good there, afternoon here. Uh, yeah, but there are many, there are many participants around the, um, the country, so I, sh I should say maybe good day. Um, uh, okay, so uh, my, my, my speak, uh, speech is, is, go is around um, facial reconstruction and the title is Imaging the Faces from the Past. Um, let me first talk about the content of my speech. The main, uh, I have three parts for my speech. The main part is um, the facial reconstruction and I will talk about mostly on the techniques facial reconstruction stages and the principles. Uh, I will not talk about uh, the definition of the facial reconstruction. I will not talk about the history of the facial reconstruction because there is no need to, to talk about it. I suppose that you are all know it or you can easily get this information just from Google. Um, so the second part is, uh, the, the second and the third part is mostly uh, the smallest part. The main part is the facial construction, but the second part I will talk about our FACES research group, what we are doing in the uh, University of Tübingen. And the third part, the third, third smallest part is, uh, I would like to talk about the research and the collaboration possibilities uh, with the scientists, with, rich, with the researchers from outside of the Germany. Uh, specifically to India and also the rest of the rest of the countries. Okay, um, so let let me talk about a little bit about for the introduction for the face. Uh, so in the world uh, there are more than seven billion people living now, and no faces are alike, even the twins. So uh, we can say that each face is unique. So in terms of morphometrics, in terms of geometric morphometrics, each face is different than, than the other. Uh, so our brains uh, have the capability of perceiving the smallest variation between the faces. And this ability allows us to, um, re to, to carry out a uh, personal recognition. So we can easily recognize our families, recognize our <clears throat> uh, relatives, our colleagues, and also even the famous people. And also this uniqueness of the face is also very, very uh, helpful for us in terms of conducting a uh, forensic investigation. 
So it really helps us to carry out, carry out an um, accurate forensic examination, forensic facial comparison or forensic facial identification, and also, but also to make a uh, positive identification. Uh, but why is why is the face is unique? Why each face is the, is different than the other? Doctor Asgur, you are you Doctor Asgur, are you sharing a slide? You want to share the slide? Yeah, I am. I am on the third slide now. No, no, no. You're, you're not. You're, 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 you should share the third slide. So you cannot see my slides. No, no, no. We can't. So then um, again, I should share no, my no, screen, no, right? No, no, it's okay. You can you can start you can start with the uh, slide slideshow. Just play the slide. Share the slide. So okay. Oh yes, oh yes. Just 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 go back. These are beautiful. <laughs> these are beautiful pictures. We would like to see that. Okay, so as I said, um, just, just the first one also. Yeah, so, so, okay. yeah, so that on the left side is my last facial reconstruction uh, for um, Sagalosos archaeological research project. So the second, second slide, I told about the, the content of my speech. So the first part is related to facial reconstruction. So it's the main part, actually. Uh, it's, I, I will talk about the techniques, stages, and the principles of, of uh, facial um, reconstruction. As I said, I will not talk about the definition, the history. You can all easily find this information from internet. Um, yeah, and um, I, the, the second part, is, second and the third part is the smallest part, and I will talk about our FACES research group. You, what we are doing in University of Tübingen in Paleoanthropology Department. And the third one is, um, I would like to talk with you um, from the, uh, for the, um, actually for the specific, for the um, Indian researchers and also the other researchers um, from outside. So what, what are the collaboration possibilities from our side, from our FACES research group with the, with the other researchers from outside. Um, so facial reconstruction is um, basically we have is uh, basically we have two two main contexts. So the first one is the forensic context. So we apply we conduct and facial reconstruction for identification purposes in order to help the um, legal authorities. And the second uh, context is archaeological context. So we um, carry out uh, facial reconstruction for archaeological cases to the museums, to the universities, to the research institutes, or any research or any scientific research project. So uh, let, let, let me talk about again about the face because the face is really really important. It is the important part of the human body, and um, as I said, there are more than seven billion people living in the world and um, no faces are alike so it means that it means that each face is unique and it's very very helpful for us as a forensic anthropologist as a forensic craniofacial id expert working in a forensic lab so it's very helpful for us to do an um, accurate facial examination and to carry out a um, positive identification so it's really really important and our brains, as I said, our brains, so we have the capability of perceiving the smallest variation between the faces. And this ability allows us to carry out an, a personal recognition. So we can easily recognize our families, our relatives, our colleagues, and the famous people. So it's possible. Um, but what is the reason? What is the basic reason that the each face is, is different than the other one? So the, uh, it's because of the skull. So because of the skull, uh, geometric morphometrics of the skull, the morpho morphometrics features of the skull is different than, than the other. So again, skull uh, has an unique uh, features. 
um, and the uh, skull is in is a basic armature and the the rest of the uh, soft tissues are la lying onto the skull are, are attaching onto the skull so the uh, the important factor affecting the face is the underlying skeleton so it's the skull and the 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 basic shape of the face is dependent on the structure of the skull so we can we can determine the head forms and the facial forms from the skull so taking some measurements so we can determine that the, the head form of that skull is dolchecephalic or mesocephalic or brachycephalic and also we can easily uh, understand we can easily determine from skull taking some measurements in order to say about uh, the uh, the facial forms like leptoprosopic, mesoprosopic, or uroprosopic. Uh, face also suggests us some details. When we are looking at face, we can easily understand or we can easily estimate the the gender and the sex of the face, uh, and we can we can estimate the age group of the of that person of that face. We can um, estimate the ethnic group or or let's say anthropological group of the face. So we call it the three of them are biological profile. And also sometimes we can also um, estimate the culture of that person and also um, health status, the health condition of that person. So what it means, it means that if we do a facial reconstruction, we have to project the, the sex, we have to project the age group and we have to project the ethnic group to the facial reconstruction work or study. Let me talk about some um, different techniques. Uh, actually, I'm following all my facial reconstruction works. I'm following the Manchester method, plus are some specific geometric morphometrics um, details. But there are also other methods, like uh, some accepted methods, like uh, American methods, um, Russian methods. Uh, but I, 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 don't, I, I will not talk about these methods because I'm, I'm always following the Manchester method. There, there is also one more method is from Istanbul method. And I uh, suppose that he's now also attending this online platform. He's the uh, Saudi Chadra and he's the um, founder of this method. But I'm, I'm following the Manchester method. So there are also different techniques in Manchester method. Which one is the three d manual technique? So the uh, the three D manual technique is is, is uh, basically the application of first biological profile, and then uh, application of the of the uh, facial soft tissue thicknesses, and then on the on the on the middle um, photograph, and then we apply the uh, facial muscles one by one by one, uh, depending on the. Um, um, the muscle attachments and the anatomical principles. And at the end, after the ap uh, application of the skin attachment, and then we reached uh, uh, the result. So this is the 3D manual technique. There is one more, another technique is the 3D manual technique and plus attachment application of the silicone. Uh, the, um, the workflow is almost the same. We, we, we got the duplication of the skull, duplicate of the skull and the application of the um, soft tissue thicknesses and then application of the all facial soft tissues, uh, specifically the, the facial muscles. And at the end, we apply an, um, silicone. Uh, we normally don't tend to apply silicone to forensic cases. Um, we just um, prefer to use silicone uh, in archaeological cases in order to get an, uh, the, reali the realistic uh, faces. The third one is a two-dimensional technique. Uh, if you are good, uh, good at on drawing, um, I can recommend you. Um, so it's basically when you, when, you, when you apply first the anthropological analysis and when you get the biological profile of the skull and then uh, you apply, the, you attach the facial soft tissue thicknesses on the skull and then you, you, you take a photograph, 2D photograph um, 
from an uh, frontward horizontal plane, and then you apply you, uh, the, of the facial muscles on drawing, drawing on, on onto the page, and at the end you 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 reach you reach the the face. Uh, this study is a friend of mine, Dr. Tobias Fulton, work from South Africa. And another technique in Manchester methods uh, is the 2D computerized technique. So it's almost the same with the 2D uh, technique. Uh, the difference is just you all are following the procedures uh, and on the, on the computer, on a software, on a graphic software. So the, the procedures is the same uh, application of the facial software thicknesses and then you apply the facial muscles uh, in order to apply it to the computerized technique, you you are supposed to have a um, uh, database for facial structures, and then depending on the anatomical uh, principles and the details of the uh, structure of the skull, you apply the facial uh, structures onto the uh, the skull, and then using using with any two uh, D graphic softwares like Photoshop, then you combine all the facial structures and you reach a result. So this is the 2D computerized technique. And uh, the last one is the um, most popular one is the 2D computerized, 3D computerized technique. Uh, actually, uh, the difference between the 3D manual technique and the 3, 3D computerized technique is just we are doing uh, computerized technique in, an, in a virtual platform. Uh, for 3D modeling software, and then we follow the same procedures, we follow the same stages for Manchester method. This is uh, one of my stud, one of my facial reconstruction work um, done in a uh, 3D modeling software. And this is another um, study from the University of Dundee. So this is the facial reconstruction of um, Sebastian Bach. He's a German composer. So you, you, may, you may see the uh, workflow of the uh, facial reconstruction. Um, the 3D digitization of the skull, application of the um, facial muscles, application of the regression formulas, and at the end you reach the, the face. Uh, for, in order to do a 3D computerized facial reconstruction, you need, you need to have some um, specific equipments like uh, 3D surface scanning. This is important. Uh, and using this uh, account, you can digitize the, um, your object like skull and then you can import it into your, uh, into your software. And the second one is, um, 3D software, modeling software, plus haptic device. On the, on the right side, you can, you can see the, uh, the haptic device. What is the role of the haptic device is, actually it's very, very important because uh, without having an haptic device, there's also possibility to do, to do a facial reconstruction, but the problem is you cannot feel the skull, you cannot feel the soft tissues, you cannot feel the, uh, the muscles, in the software, so they are all virtual. So uh, because of not having, not feeling this this object skull and the soft tissue, so it's it's getting a little bit difficult to do it. Because in manual method, we uh, we we using with our fingers, we feel the skull, we feel we feel the our clay as um, muscles and soft tissue. So. It's enable us to, it enables us to do an, a proper facial construction. But in, in 3D uh, software, it's, it's not possible to feel it. So what, what is the role of uh, haptic device is, is, is this. So it's using this haptic device, uh, we can um, feel the skull, we can feel the, every object, every uh, facial muscles, uh, pads, everything, you can easily feel it. And, you can easily manipulate it. So it's, it's, I think it's very, very important. It's a very basic uh, 3D computer facial construction station. As you see, we have the haptic device, a software, and the 3D scanner.
Let's move on. So it's a uh, fresh reconstruction of a um, Sagalasos man, as you see for the whole workflow, starting from on the left side, the skull, digitization, application of the um, facial muscles, application of the regression formulas, and at the end, we reached the skull. We will talk about a little bit detail uh, about these stages in the next slides. Uh, and then, uh, after comp comp uh, comp complement of the uh, complication of the um, facial reconstruction in uh, 3D, then we apply um, silicon in order to get a realistic face because it's an archaeological case and uh, we need to have a more realistic face. So we apply um, silicon onto the facial reconstruction. And after that, we uh, apply pros re realistic prosthetic eyes and then we reel um, hair and of course the making up and then we got the, uh, the results. So this is the um, facial construction of, of um, Sagalasos men from Sagalasos archaeological research uh, project. So as you see, uh, it's a combination of to uh, to to techniques is a combination of computerized method. It's a combination of then of then and uh, silicon. Let's move on uh, to the workflow. Um, so I call it PAR. So what it means? P is the preparation of a facial reconstruction work. A is an anthropological analysis, and R is the main. Uh, workflow is the reconstruction. So what is the P preparation? So because of having a different techniques, so, that, so therefore we have different stages. For manual um, technique, uh, we have actually um, five phases, which first one is the reassembling and the remodeling of the uh, skull because in most of the case, uh, especially for the fancy cases and also for the archaeological cases, we receive the skull not in just one part. So we receive in, in uh, too many pieces. So it needs to be first reassembling. And then cleaning of the, um, the uh, specimens and then consolidation in order to protect the skull. And P4 is the uh, important is the molding and casting phase. And P5 is at the end, um, we uh, apply, uh, we mount the skull onto the station. So this is the preparation phase for uh, manual method. So for digital methods, so we have three main phases, which is more, much more faster than manual method, just through the scanning of the skull. And then we um, do some post-processing applications like uh, smoothing, like filling the holes, like erasing the unrelated parts. And after, the, after this uh, stage two, then we import the 3D data into our software like Freeform or any other 3D, 3D, 3D modeling software. So this is a digital. And the third one, I call it, it's Digiman. So it's the combination of digitally and manually methods. So first we um, scan the skull with using a surface scanner. Then we apply 3D post-processing and then we send it to 3D printing. And after that, we uh, mount the skull onto the uh, station. So if you have a 3D, 3D scanner and 3D printer, I I definitely recommend uh, this third um, phase because it's much more faster and secure than the manual method. So this is the preparation phases. Um, I will not talk into detail because of the time, but um, maybe we, in, in the future, if, if, we have organ if we organize another lecture, then I, I can talk about detail about these preparation phases. The second, um, uh, phase is A, we call it A, uh, anthropological analysis. Again, I will not talk about in detail because it's a different story, it's a different of world. So in, we have two, two main um, parts in uh, anthropological analysis. The first one is 
the uh, determination of biological profile. So it's actually a work of a forensic anthropology. Um, so we, uh, we analyze the skull and then we decide the biological profile of the skull as age determination, sex determination, and ancestor determination. And we always say that if a forensic facial uh, practitioner, if he's not a forensic anthropologist or forensic odontologist, uh, we, uh, we recommend him or her not to do a biological profile um, onto the skull. Um, so it needs to be done by a professional, by, a, by, by professionals, because it's really important. And after the determination of the biological profile, uh, we then, I think this is the most important part of facial reconstruction is the determination of the skull characteristics on, onto the facial, facial reconstruction. And now the third part as the main part is the facial reconstruction phases. So we have um, six main phases for facial reconstruction. The, the first one is the placement of the FSTT, facial soft tissue thicknesses based on the biological profile. That's why I'm, I'm telling that the biological profile is important and needs to be done and professional because we then apply the FSTT based on biological profile. So we apply um, these facial soft tissue thicknesses based on, based on uh, age group, sex and, and uh, ethnic group. And, and after this, uh, the second uh, stage is the placement of the eye. So the placement of the eye in the orbital cavity and the protrusion of the eye. And the third one is maybe the, it takes too much time in, in facial construction work is the muscle attachments because for uh, following in Manchester method, we apply the muscles one by one onto the skull and it, it takes too much time. And then uh, we start to model the facial structures like nose, mouth, um, ear, and the rest of the facial structures. And at the, then uh, we attach the skin attachment. And at the end, uh, based, based on our um, detections, our um, observations about the facial characteristics, which facial characteristics should be project onto the face and this is this is that um, stage and also the projecting of the aging based on the age group of the um, person so for placement of the fstt facial soft tissue thicknesses we, we did many uh, research on it and uh, if you have an um, DICOM analyze software. There are many commercial softwares in this uh, field, and then you can you can easily import the DICOM data, the radiological data, into your software, and then you can make them like uh, transparency, and then you can easily uh, first understand the real relationship between the soft tissue and the hard tissue, and then also uh, with creating some um, planes. And then you can easily measure the thickness of the face. And then if you have a huge data, and then you can easily get your, uh, create your, your population, population data for, uh, for FSTT. Um, for facial soft thicknesses, we have basically, we have 31 landmarks. These are the definition of the landmarks. And as you see on the picture, in different um, part of the skull, uh, we, we attach the landmarks uh, onto the skull and then using this radiological data, we, we, we get the uh, facial soft tissue thicknesses. But of, of course, I, uh, for facial reconstruction, I don't use all of them. I don't use uh, 31 landmarks. Normally, I prefer 18 or 19 um, facial landmarks, so these, these, these landmarks are, are enough in order to do a proper facial reconstruction. Um, so this is the uh, digitization of the skull and um, so the 3D skull and the, on the right side, so this is the 3D skull with the application of the facial soft tissue thicknesses onto the skull. 
um, so based on our research, also the literature also shows that there is a distinct differences between the sex in terms of facial soft tissue thicknesses. There are some differences between the age groups. There are some differences between also the um, ethnic groups. So uh, in order to do an um, accurate facial reconstruction, you need to get an accurate, correct biological profile in order to apply a correct facial soft tissue thickness onto the skull. Let's move on to the, to the eye. Uh, for the, the, the eyeballs are, is, is important in terms of the um, placement in the orbital cavity. So we have a specific anatomical principles, uh, how far should, should be the uh, eyeball to the, to the upper wall uh, of the orbital cavity or the lateral wall or the inner wall or the bottom wall. And uh, the, the next important thing is the um, application of the inner county and the outer county. So normally there are some skull characteristics that it helps a lot uh, in order to understand where is the um, inner county, location of the inner county and where is the, where is the location of the outer county. So we use for um, inner county, we use the lacrimal fossa. And for other country, we, 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 we use the Mallard tubercle. Of course, the Mallard tubercle is not very uh, possible to find every time for every skull to find the Mallard tubercle. Then we have a very specific measurements, uh, taking that measurements from the um, fronto, frontozygomotic suture, and then we can easily find the other country. So, um, in average, the inner county is two millimeter to the lateral, uh, two millimeter lateral to the lacrimal crest, and for other county is the uh, uh, three to four millimeter medial to the mother tobacco. So this is the placement of the eyeball and the placement of the inner and outer county, and also after that we can also get the eye fissure and eye fissure length, and then the next one is the protrusion of the eye eyeballs. So normally based on the um, anatomical principles, uh, we take a tangent from supraorbital to the infraorbital as you see here. Um, and then uh, based on the anatomical principles, the eyeball produces this tangent a uh, 3.8 millimeter. And we have also another formula uh, as you can see on the left side. Uh, you, you, if, if the um, orbital cavity is not broken and if, if you digitize it in a software and then you can easily measure the depth of the orbital cavity and then when you put it into your uh, formula then you can get the how much should be the eye, uh, protrusion of the eye, eyeballs. But um, so this 3.8 millimeter is, is an average and it works for almost, almost every case if, if that person has any, any, uh, hasn't got any um, healthy problems on eye, eye region. Normally 3.8 millimeter works very well. For the uh, eyebrows, um, it's, there is also some studies on it. We also tested it in our pilot study and it works. We, we got also the similar results. So when you, when you analyze the nasal root and when you analyze the uh, arcus superciliaris, the brow ridges, and you can, you can have some estimation about the, uh, the direction of the, the style of the eyebrows. So let's say if you, if you analyze the skull and if you, if you think that the, uh, the nasal root is very low and the brow ridges is very weak and then your eyebrow is going to be S-shaped. So there, there are some uh, different categories on it. Um, it's not 100% accurate, but based on our pilot study, we got some similar results. So let's talk about the third stage of uh, facial reconstruction is the muscle attachments. Uh, based on the skull characteristics, based on the uh, anatomical principles and muscle attachments, 
we apply all the muscles, uh, muscles of mastication and the facial muscles, uh, one by one onto the skull. We first start with the temporalis muscle and then masseter muscle, orbicularis oris, mentalis muscle, um, depressor labia inferioris, and then depressor angularis muscle, vaccinator muscles, levator, levator's muscles, and then orbicularis oculi, and then zygomaticus major and minor muscles, which are very, very important in terms of to estimate the, the contour of the face. And then the alakinasi muscle, and at the end, the application of the parotid gland. So we apply uh, all these uh, muscles one by one and very, very carefully um, onto the skull. That's why it takes too much time for us to to complete the application all the muscles uh, but it's very important and the important thing is the you should always uh, analyze you should always look at the characteristics of the, the skull muscle attachments and these uh, allows us to to uh, apply a proper muscle attachments onto the skull uh, let's talk about the nose uh, in terms of the determination of the nasal width, um, actually there are many methods, uh, but uh, some methods have an high, higher accuracy level, some methods have lower. Um, this, is, this, is, this formula is from Mikhail Gerasimov, from a Russian anthropologist. And this, this formula is a very, very basic formula, but it works very, very well. Uh, based on our research, it's much more accurate than the other, um, other formulas in terms of the determination of the facial, um, the nasal width. So it's very, very basic. So you measure the maximum um, width of the nasal aperture. And then when you put it into, into your formula, then you will get the uh, maximal width of the soft nose, nasal width. For the uh, nasal length, there, is also, there are also many uh, methods, many regression formulas. Um, but I'm following the Chris Ryan methods. And also we, um, a little bit, uh, um, change this method based on our uh, data and it works very very well so how, how it works first uh, you need to take a uh, line like a tangent which pass from the uh, nasion to prostion here and then you you are going to take uh, three different measurements uh, we call it x y z so x x is the nasion to acantion rhinion to subspinale and nasion to subspinale when you get these three measurements then you are um, you are supposed to put these um, numerical data into our uh, regression formula one and two and one um, provides us the as the number uh, the number line one the number line one is uh, the line is uh, it should be perpendicular to the nasion, okay? And there, there should be a 90 degree with the uh, nasion prostion line. And num the regression number two is the line of the number two. And the number two is starts from the, at the end of the number, number uh, line one. And number, number line two should be uh, parallel to the nasion and prostion line and at the end of the number uh, line two is the exact location of the end of the nose okay it seems a little a little bit maybe uh, confused but actually it's not it's very very simple and very primitive so this is the uh, determination of the length of the nose and you, the best thing is to uh, uh, to, to apply this method in your own population data. Maybe you should 
uh, manipulate, you should um, adjust this regression formula uh, based on your population data. So this data should work only for um, Caucasians. So it's not possible to apply this regression formula to, to Africans. So it needs to be adjusted on, on the specific populations. So we, 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 we did it for our population and now it works pretty good. So let's, let's, let, let me show you an example. So if you, if you take these three measurements from X, Y, Z, and if you put it into your R regression formula one and two, then we, we get the, the, the length of the number line one, let's say it's 27.2 and the number line two. So it is 39.8.8. So, uh, 27.2 should be perpendicular to the nasion and should, should be um, um, as a 90 degree with the nasion prostion line. And at the end of the number line one, it should, the number line two should start and this line should be parallel to the uh, nasion prostion line. So at the end, you will get the, as if, you, if you look at the um, right image, then you can easily see that the length of the uh, of the um, end the, the, at the end point of the length of the nose is is there. So it's based on our uh, regression formula. So in our software, it's very easy to do it. You create a plane, and then uh, you will take all these measurements with using S zip lines. So it's very easy to do it to take measurements to apply it on an on a um, um, 3D data. So I should say that it's not possible to do uh, and to do this uh, technique in manual methods. It's possible, but it's not as accurate as um, in, in uh, 3D software because you, when you make it as your um, soft tissue, as a transparent, then you can easily take a measurement if there is any inconsistency then you can easily adjust it uh, so it's possible so 3d uh, techniques uh, computerized te techniques are is is always better than uh, manual method i shall I, I shall say and the next one is the gerasimov tangent so as you see this is the number line one and this is the number line Two, so this is the at the end of the length of the nose. But what about the nasal tip? Nasal tip should be different than the uh, nasal length. So the, this is the this is the nasal tip. How we um, decide the nasal tip? We apply our uh, another um, technique is for the Gerasimov tangent. We call it the Gerasimov tangent. We take an um, ten, we, we take a line from coming from Rignon and um, another line coming from nasal spine, and then the intersection is the uh, nasal tip of the nose. But the important thing is uh, taking the line from uh, Rignon and from nasal spine, it should be in an accurate way. If you take this line, and um, if, you, if, you, if you have a mistake or if you take this line incorrect, then your nasal tip should be somewhere else. So important thing is in a Gerasimov tangent to take this line in an accurate way. This is another view from our software. Uh, as you see here, you can you can you, you will see the tangent of the orbital of, of the supraorbital and the infraorbital and, and other uh, measurements that you can uh, take the measurements and it's very helpful for us to placement of the eyeballs. Let's move on. So yeah, um, when you um, apply the soft tissue nose on the face and then you can easily check if your nose, soft tissue of the nose is um, created um, correctly or, or, or not. So it's very easy to check it in, in, in our 3D software. You make this um, facial soft tissue as a transparent and then you can easily check it. Uh, if it is consistent with the heart tissue or not. 
Um, for the prediction of the nose, um, um, from the Chris Ryan method, there are, there are other three uh, regression formulas. It's the four, five, four, five, and six. So it is. Uh, it's also possible to 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 control it, to check it if it is uh, correctly modeled or not. So it is related to the nasal height, nasal length, and nasal depth. Let's move on to the mouth. Um, there, there are also other many techniques for determination of the, the width of the mouth. I am following the method from Kromann and Ischan. So it's a very basic and it's, it's, um, it's okay. It's pretty, pretty accurate method. So you take an radiating lines from the conjunction of the maxillary canine and the premolar uh, feet. And then these radiating lines, this decides the, the, the width of the mouth. So in our software, you can easily create some planes, as you see on the left and the right image. So you can create your plane um, as in perpen uh, as in perpendicular to the uh, to the skull and then you can you can take this radiating lines and then it can easily shows us the the width of the mouth so what is the next is the thickness of the lip we have also some formulas for it so we take some measurements on the mandibulary and the maxillary um, central central incisors and when you put it into our regression formula then we will get the thickness of the upper lip and the thickness of the lower lip what is what is the other uh, detail for the mouth is the uh, some mouth shapes uh, especially for the upper lip is um, sometimes it might be flat or sometimes as you see here as an V shape, so it's called Cupid's bow shape. So how we understand if this um, upper lip is going to be a flat or a Cupid's bow shape, or the filtrum, the width of the filtrum, or the depthness of the filtrum? So we will we will look at the uh, the maxillary um, dental area. So. Um, when, when, when we take the measurements between the central maxillary incisors, the, the upper point, so the the wider uh, measurements, this it's it's it shows you that um, your filtrum width is going to be wide, and so as you see here, so there is going to be a V shape. When the V shape is, if it is very very deep, then it means that your filtrum is going to be deep. Okay, and when you are when you are following this dental line, animal line, and also it shows you uh, about the your um, upper lip is going to be flat or is going to be a cupid's bow shape. So it's 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 a study from uh, my friends, my colleague Tobias Hulton from South Africa, and then they apply it for South African population. We apply this um, this um, information uh, based on our on, on our um, Caucasian data, but very very small data. We got similar results, but we will apply it in an, in a larger data. So also there are, there are some many other characteristics need to be projected on the face. As you see on the two photographs, uh, you may easily understand the differences between the two photographs. On the left side, actually the, the, these are the same persons. On the left side, he has a deep uh, nasolabial line. On, on, on that photograph, on the right side, he is not as deep as on the left side. So when we are doing a facial reconstruction, how we can decide this? Specifically, specifically for this uh, nasolabial lines. So th 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 that's why I'm always telling to my students, they're telling to my participants that the, uh, the important thing is to understand the characteristics of the skull. So for example, this one, nasolabial line, 
if the canine fossa is very deep, so uh, the the uh, for the uh, projecting projecting on the soft tissue of the face, so he's going to have an um, prominent. He's going to have a very deep uh, nasolabial lines. So these facial characteristics, or or if he's going to have a cleft chin, or if he's going to have a dimple nose. Um, some other characteristics of the uh, chin of the um, the mandible. So it's based all on these facial characteristics. So the important things is determination of the facial characteristics from skull, and then project it into the um, soft tissue. So this is the um, image of an soft skull with the soft tissue of the nose based on the regression formulas and the mouth and these photographs on the left side is the um, skull with fsgts and with the facial muscles on the right side is the um, skull with fsgts and the um, facial structures based on the regression formulas so when you combine these two datas and you are going to have an with, with, with skin attachments, then you are going to have an um, result of a facial reconstruction. So uh, this is another image that you apply, we apply the skin attachment onto the face and uh, we, make, we make it a little bit transparency in order to see the skin and inside the skin, under, underneath the skin, the, the facial soft tissue, tissues and the scalp. From from frontal view, as you see the um, with the transparency of the skin attachment. So this is this is the study of mine. Um, so based on our workflow, as we as, as we discussed uh, in previous slides. So we on the on on the left one, we digitize the skull. We attach the facial soft thicknesses onto the skull. We attach all the facial um, muscles. And based on based on our um, regression formula, we we apply the facial structures like uh, the the ear, nose, mouth, and also the orbital placement, the protrusion, and at the end, the based on the facial characteristics of the skull and the aging, and then we we result we 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 will get the result of the facial reconstruction. Uh, I, will, I will I will show you uh, just an, uh, for this so this is for a 3D 3D computerized method of a facial reconstruction. Now I will show you a manual facial reconstruction of an example from Oberkasselmann in Germany. So it's also called Chromagnum. Uh, so based on the workflow, what we have done is we we, we get the duplicate double duplicate of the real skull. And then we apply it, we mount it onto a facial reconstruction station. And then after the determination of the biological profile, we apply the, the all uh, facial soft tissue thicknesses onto skull here. And then based on our um, decisions about the biological profile and the facial characteristics, and then we apply here, all the facial muscles onto the skull one by one with using a clay and it's not it's not using in a software so rather than we, we we use our fingers we use the clay and then we follow the same procedure as we follow in 3d software but as i said um, it's a little bit difficult more difficult than the 3d software especially um, application of the regression formulas because it's very very difficult to uh, position let's say the position of the inner county and the other county we use some small pins and also the application of the uh, the nasal soft tissues is also difficult than application in a software but it takes a little bit more time uh, then, then the treat software. So this is the application of the 
soft tissue tissues onto the skull and at the end we got the result of a facial construction of an Oberkasselmann or facial construction of a crab magna. Um, so let's talk about the facial construction of the Sagalosos woman. Uh, we, so this is, an, this is an international research project from Sagalosos Archaeological Research Project. It's managed by the um, Katholische University of Leuven from Belgium. And then they sent me the skull and, the, and I uh, created the facial construction of the Sagalosos woman. So this, when we receive the skull, we first digitize it with using a surface scanner. And then uh, we also apply the biological profile uh, in, based on our decision that it is a female between uh, around 30 years of age and the Caucasians. And then we apply the, uh, on the right side, right image, as you see, we apply the facial soft thicknesses on the skull. And then the second stage is the application of the orbital uh, eye uh, ball in the orbital cavity, the placement and the protrusion of the eyes. As I said, we, we, we create a tangent from supraorbital and infraorbital and based on, on the anatomical, pr uh, anatomical principles, we place the uh, eyeball in the orbital cavity. And then we, we, we start to apply all the uh, muscles onto the skull with, with starting with the uh, temporalis masseter and goes on one by one the muscles. At the end, we attach the parotid gland. So this is the workflow from skull to the uh, attachment of the facial muscles. And then we create the plane and then we take some, we take the, the measurements uh, as we discussed in the talk in the previous slides with the X, Y, Z, and then take the measurements, put it into our regression formula and also the <clears throat> regression, uh, sorry, so uh, the grasmal tangent in order to understand the nasal tip. And this is an image from frontal view. And then we uh, model the, um, the, the nasal structure, nasal soft structure onto the skull. And then as you see, it's, it's, it's consistent with the regression formula. And then uh, based on our um, facial characteristics, we, we all apply onto our skin, onto the face. And this is the skin with uh, transparency and under, underneath the skin, you can easily see the skull, FSTT, and the um, facial soft structures as muscles. And this is the facial reconstruction, the result of the facial reconstruction of the, of the Sagalasos woman. And this is another this is another view so on the lateral view with the transparency with the skull soft tissue uh, thicknesses and the the result and after after that we send it to a 3D printer this is the uh, 3D print view and after that we got this 3D print of this facial reconstruction study and then. Uh, we apply as in for to, to work in order to have a uh, realisticity. We apply silicon. So what I did is what we, what what I did is first uh, to get a mold and then the casting, and then with with using the silicon, and we we got this result for a face with silicon. And the next stage is the application of the realistic, um, uh, the prosthetic eyes and makeup, also the real hair. And then we get this result of the facial reconstruction of Sagalosos woman. And nowadays, uh, that, that's me. <laughs> so um, now this face um, 
is uh, it's an exhibition in last year in in Leuven and this year it is uh, exhibited in Yapukredi uh, Museum in Istanbul now. So at the end for my my first part of my uh, speech, uh, what is my recommendations to the uh, colleagues who are interested in uh, facial reconstruction? I have two recommendations. The first one is the educational background. So um, I think that any uh, person who is coming from um, any science, odontology, anthropology, forensic medicine, uh, archaeology, uh, fine arts, he has to have or he or she has to have an educational background of uh, osteology, especially for the uh, skull osteology, skull skeleton, um, facial morphology, facial anthropology. These are really, really important. And if, if, if any person is not coming from forensic odontology or forensic anthropology, he shouldn't apply the um, biological profile. He needs to get a consultancy from a forensic anthropologist or forensic odontologist. So uh, what I mean is the educational background is important. If you are coming from fine arts, that's fine. You can, you can get an uh, additional uh, trainings like um, short-term trainings, long-term trainings to get a background of facial anthropology, including the, the hard tissue and also the soft tissue and also the facial anatomy. The important thing is also the muscle attachments, the facial muscles and the relationship between the um, skull and the soft tissues. Uh, my second recommendation is practical experiences, of course, uh, so if you have any uh, access to any collection um, after, 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 after having a background and then you should apply many um, practical cases. That, that's really, really important. And the third one, I think this is very, very important, is the working within radiological data, especially for the DICOM data. So if you have an access to a DICOM data or that, that database, uh, I would definitely recommend to work in on these uh, data. Uh, what what enables you is, is to you is to have an understanding what is the relationship between the soft tissue and the hard tissue. So first analyze the skull in very detail and then analyze the soft tissue in very detail in this DICOM analysis software, and then make the soft tissue as a transparency, and then uh, you can easily at the same time, the soft tissue and the uh, hard tissue, and then try to, try to investigate, try to understand the relationship between the hard tissue, the relationship with, and the soft tissue. So it will uh, be very, very helpful for you, for your, future, for your future studies, if you receive a skull and then you can easily estimate that that's a, that's a very specific characteristic on the skull and it should be projected in this way. So that's why uh, it's very important to work on DICOM data. DICOM data is very, very helpful for us to, to improve um, formulas to improve new principles, new techniques. It's very, very helpful. So these are my recommendations for the new researchers who are very, very interest, interested in craniofacial reconstruction. So the second uh, part, it's going to be, I know I talk, talk too much time, sorry about that. Um, very, 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 very uh, fast. I will talk about the second part is our faces. Uh, the faces, our research group in the University of Tübingen in our paleoanthropology department. So it's called uh, Forensic Archaeological Chronofacial Evaluation and Service. So what, what we have in, in our um, lab, 
um, as, um, as Aman knows, he came to our department in March. So he is the last person, last participant because of this corona pandemic. So we, we, we cannot receive any participants anymore. Uh, Amand knows our department very well now. So uh, he also worked and he also did some, pra some practices on our equipment. So we have a um, 3D anatomy table. It's very, very helpful to understand for the students, for the participants, to understand the relationship between the soft tissue and the hard tissue and also the, the um, facial muscles. And we have um, facial reconstruction system with haptic device. We have a CT scanner. We have uh, three different uh, surface scanner and we have a very huge um, skeleton collection. And in, we, are, we are offering courses. We are offering um, especially facial reconstruction course and uh, 3D computerized facial reconstruction course. Uh, but for these uh, coronavirus problems, we are not thinking about to offer maybe in the future um, online trainings. Um, I, would, I would like to show you a very a short video from our last manual facial reconstruction course. Let me play it. So all the uh, participants, all the students have their own um, station. And uh, in four days, uh, first they learn uh, every stages of the facial reconstruction. And then they will apply all these uh, stages onto, the, on, onto their cases. So this is a video from our facial reconstruction manual, manual facial reconstruction course. And so the last one from Aman, uh, so this, these are the 3D facial reconstruction course. Uh, so it's a very intensive course. Um, the participant will learn every stages of facial construction using with 3D software, using with 3D um, haptic device. So these are these are our um, courses. What what we have, what what we offer. Um, so the last last part is the the international project collaboration. So in Germany, there are several research institutes um, which support the researchers. They have a huge grants. I just would like to talk about just one, which is the biggest one, is the DFG. It's called uh, Deutsche Forschung Gemeinschaft. DFG is a um, German research uh, institute and it has a, a huge budget, more than 3.5 3 billion euro. And there is also possibility to, to make an international um, collaboration. And, and the FG have, have some several offices outside. One, which, one is, which one of them is in, in New Delhi in India. So it's, it's very, very uh, important for, for Germany and for India as well. So if any um, person who would like to um, do a research on chronofacial analysis, chronofacial identification, and also who, who would like to contact us, we, can, we, we, we are very open to do a collaboration to research, international research with, 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 our, with, with our researchers from outside. Uh, you, can, you can get more information about uh, the DFG India office, and then um, um, if you have any uh, idea, if you, if you would like to work on, to, to do some studies, to do some research on in, uh, in the chronofacial identification research and would like to work with us, would like to visit us, would like to do a um, joint collaboration, you are very, very welcome. 
to do an international um, collaboration with us. So there are some possibilities like um, international research tra training groups, collaborative research centers. So just uh, look at the website and get some details about so there are some details about who can apply for it, um, what is the other requirements for it, how long is the duration. So it's a very good duration for 12 years. And um, there is some exchange of researchers to Germany, to India, also for the other countries, and to do to perform an, um, workshops, um, doctorate programs, uh, visiting researchers, they're all possible. So um, if, you, if you have a look, so we are, all, um, we are all open to any research on chronofacial identification. As, as I said, we have a very good uh, facility and we would like to uh, work with you who are very, very interested in chronofacial identification. As you see in our uh, picture, uh, you are very welcome to, to our lovely city, Tübingen. If you would like to get more information about our uh, courses, trainings, or international projects, uh, you, can, you can get more information from our website here, or you can just send me an email to me. Uh, you can, uh, for the Indian uh, colleagues, you can contact with Aman. Uh, we have a very good contact with him, and uh, would like to. We have we have we have already determined to do some uh, future joint projects. Uh, you can contact with him um, to organize and um, new possibilities in terms of in terms of good collaborations. So that's for me. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to thank all you of you for listening. It was, it was a great show. As usual, uh, you have been a, uh, a great inspiration always. Uh, before uh, we uh, start over with the questions and I pass over uh, th uh, things to uh, uh, Dr. Deepika for question answer session. Uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Shadi Nadir is there with us. Uh, great, great. We have uh, such a great scientist with us. Uh, he happens to be this, uh, the the from the same league of uh, Iskan. So so uh, amazing to have so many great researchers with us. Then uh, uh, before I start with the question, we start over with the question answer session. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mark is there from US. Um, uh, it, it, he's a, it is a question from my side as well as him uh, to you. And then Deepika can take over. The question is that how do you add? Uh, are there any parameters for adding the skin wrinkles? On the face, are there any parameters for? Uh, is there any classification, etc., available? Uh, it mainly depends on the population. So um, the, the 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 thing is need to be a research done on your population. For example, what we have done in our population is we uh, create first a very huge data of the facial photographs for. Um, uh, calibrated from frontal and lateral view photographs from our population in based on in different age groups and then we um, we um, categorize it and based on some wrinkle um, uh, in uh, how, how you call it wrinkle density uh, scales then we digitize them and then at the end of our project we have our um, wrinkles, um, density of the wrinkles of the face based on in different ages and based on uh, the sex. So what, what we are doing is, of course, it's not possible to, uh, to estimate all the wrinkles from the skull. So what we need to do is to get this help from our um, our, our study based on based on or based on our populations. So, um, if for our population, we have our this data. Let's say if you receive a skull from um, from a male, let's say Turk between 30 and 40 years of age. So at the end of our at the end of our facial reconstruction, we apply these uh, wrinkles. The density of the of the wrinkles onto this onto the face based on our our database. 
uh, of course, it's an average. It's not possible to to estimate and the the real density, the real prominency of the wrinkles. It's not very possible, but we follow all of our um, procedures as a scientific way. So, the, as I said, so it needs to be an uh, research on on your population, and then you should get your aging characteristics of your own population. Right. Yeah, um, Dr. Orzul, amazing uh, talk. Thank you very much. We were all, it was very stimulating and um, you would realize that because there is like a whole lot of uh, questions in the chat session. <laughs> Dr. Raman has been kind of trying to answer quite a few, but I have to direct a few to you too. Um, Dr. Priyanka has asked that uh, in fragmented skulls or in hemimandibular reconstructions, uh, do we have any predictive uh, reg regressive formulas? Similarly, um, Dr. Sharvani Joshi, Akash Sagu, they have these questions that you know, they have peculiarities like gunshot wounds or trauma to the skull. Then how, how does the software um, kind of, you know, deal with it? Okay. Um... So there, there, there are two ways we are following it. Um, if, if it is an um, trauma, like gunshot trauma, so it's a possibility of also the changement of the morpho morphological structure of this skull. So if, if first what we are doing is, uh, we all, if you have a CT, if you have a CT scanner, you can use a CT scanner to scan all, all the specimens. Or you can you can you can scan one by one with using a surface scanner, and then we import all the pieces into our software, and based on our osteological knowledge, we apply, we um, merge, we reassemble all the pieces in our software, and also um, we have an average skull based on the uh, head forms. And then uh, using we using we using with an uh, geometric morphometric techniques to estimate um, the missing parts of the of the uh, fragmented pieces. Try to under try to estimate the uh, missing parts with using geometric morphometric techniques. Um, for for mandible, some of some of the cases uh, or most of the time. Uh, we receive just a cranium without the mandible. So it's, it's a little bit uh, challenging. And then we try to estimate the mandible um, as basic, basically like the length of width uh, as we have some um, formulas for it. Uh, the, the accuracy level is not very, very high, but at least um, we, we apply these methods try to uh, try to estimate the mandibular dimensions from uh, the cranial measurements try to estimate the mandible we are working on a new uh, study to uh, understand to estimate the mandibular dimensions using with 3d ge ge geometric morphometrics okay. uh, right. a similar thing uh, dr vijay risu is asking that uh, if there is trauma to the middle thirds of the face, then what happens to the nose reconstruction? <laughs> no, nose is the toughest part. <laughs> That's it's, what. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really challenging. It's really really difficult. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the, as I said, there is also two ways. The one way is just just having a prediction, uh, like subjective prediction, or we are, if, if we have a database of that population, so we are using 3D morphometric geometry, morphometric geometry, geometric morphometrics try to estimate an, an average um, uh, heart tissue for nose form. Um, a lot of our participants are odontologists. So mm -hmm. there's an obvious thing of, you know, what is the role of teeth? What if there are no teeth? How do we kind of, uh, you know, build up on that? And do we put the teeth before doing the reconstruction or how does it work? I should say, first I should say that um, dental structure is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Dental occlusion is very, very important. 
and also if there is any problems on the um, overjet overbytes problems so um, actually I should say that um, the opinions of the forensic odontologist is very very important for us for example what I'm doing is if there is a very specific characteristic of skull in terms of the, the dental occlusion or if there is a very anomaly or any 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 anatomical differences on the dental dental um, area I will definitely consult the forensic odontologist because uh, their opinions is very very helpful for us because they have more experience than the forensic anthropologist and their opinions is very helpful for us in, in order to project the uh, soft tissue of the dental area. Uh, the teeth is important for, for the uh, determination of the, 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 the thickness of the lip because we don't, we don't have any other um, information. So we just, we, we, we have to use the teeth um, otherwise, we don't have any other clues or uh, how to how thickness of the lip. So the teeth is important for us, especially the the thickness of the lip and also for the the width of the mouth. Mm -hmm. It's also related to to the to the to the um, the near neighbor, neighborhood areas like canine fossa, like the the maxillary area. So it's not possible to evaluate just one part so you need to you need to always um evaluate like in holistic it's seven o'clock holistic um observation but uh, as i said in my recommendation uh, the important thing is 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 they have an um, good experience on radiological data so if 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 you if, if you have an um, face with a problem on dental occlusion, then go to do the to the CT scan, try to compare the hard tissue and the soft tissue. Maybe 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 you you will you will improve a new technique for it. So for the last ten years, um, there are there are very very good improvements on it, and it's also possible to check the previous uh, techniques which were improved on. The determination of facial facial structures. Uh, yeah, as I said, um, working on the uh, DICOM data is really important. Okay, um, Dr. Vinita wanted to know that uh, if we want to set up a lab similar to yours, what would be the whole cost of uh, you know setting up uh, <laughs> the whole thing? Uh, we, are not, we, are, we are not here to replicate a lab here. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, Dr. Osgood, please tell. Um, it's changed actually because the, the cost of the softwares are totally um, different. Some softwares, let's, let, let, I can say some softwares, if for, for it's used for facial construction, it costs 1,000 euro. But um, Aman knows that the free form with haptic device is it's more than 20,000 euro. Is it also, it's also the same for um, 3D scanner. So you, you may find a 3D scanner with 1,500 US dollars, which works not very good. I don't prefer to use them. But also there are some other uh, 3D surface scanners with a very, a very, with a very low error rate. Uh, it's around 30, uh, 20,000 euro. So for creating an, uh, manual lab actually it's nothing so you just need a table with a facial construction um, station uh, just you need some clays uh, in terms of clay so there are some um, sulfur non sulfur uh, clays uh, it, is it they're, they're a little bit expensive but it's it's nothing so it doesn't cost too much time for 3d 3d facial construction lab for minimum, I can say that, um, let's say 20,000, 20, 25,000 euro, at least at, at a basic level. But also when, you are, when you are counting in euros, they are multiplying it with 80, 80, 90 rupees. <laughs> so keep that in mind. You are just, you're just saying 20,000, they, they are jumping. They do not know that it has to be multiplied with some other amount as well. Okay. <laughs> 
and and one more thing i would like to add we are we are talking you are talking from germany where most of the uh, the softwares which you are using are the paid ones there are uh, I, in a, the, uh, there are countries where uh, softwares might be available free of cost as well yeah the, the yeah the softwares at, are at home we do not promote it but that but then it, it is available uh, in the in the original countries. and pirated i think pirated versions are available we do not recommend it of course yeah uh dr dipika that's it we we cannot take much more, much more questions uh, uh i'll 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 give it, give it to dr priyanka to conclude and uh, before that before she starts with her conclusion a uh, special thank you to dr ranjit as well okay yes yes actually um thank you dr oscar for such an enlightening lecture it was just amazing and um on my personal front also from my team definitely it's a big big thanks for accepting this invitation and i'm sure all the participants are hanging on to each word of yours and uh, regarding me i'm an orthodontist and for me your topic was like music to my ears you know i am routinely every day talking about cephalic index cranial index facial index malocclusion procumbency proclination over to by this is my routine thing so for me it's it's like you know homecoming so thank you so much for everything and um, on the part of uh, inpafo indo pacific uh, association for forensic odontology i would like to thank goria sir for giving us his uh, ags under his ags we have conducted this and to af ohr dr emilio a big big thanks for your support and also to iscfi a big thanks to dr jisuja and dr neeraj so we've been able to organize past four lectures also under all this support and dr pooja definitely for all the certificate work and all the other supporting related work thank you dr osgur once again and thank you all the participants for sparing your time and for giving this lecture such a wonderful response okay before we thank conclude uh, one more thing uh, the part the the the, the uh, certificates are going to come to you and uh, before we conclude also thank you to dr ranjit for giving his sparing dr. his time taking care of everything uh, for us and uh, we conclude by saying a big thank you to you as well from my side dr asgur thank you we, we conclude thank you so much thank you sir thank you so much sir you're welcome thank i also would like to thank to all of you for listening to me for organizing this this this, this link will be available to you dr asgur and everyone this uh, link to this lecture will be available to you very shortly okay thank you thank you so much thank you very much